All aboard, brothers! Ten minutes. Lots can happen in ten minutes. All aboard. All aboard, brothers! Can't miss it. Just need ten minutes for a quick shot. Train leaves in ten minutes. All aboard. Train number 202, Toronto to Ottawa. Ten minutes is enough to lose your job. Be tidy. All aboard. Smart and snappy appearance, especially in uniform. Don't you dare miss it. Ten minutes. Lots can happen in ten minutes. Ten demerit points and ten mouths to feed. Work 21, Work 21 sleep Just three. need sleep 10 minutes three. for a quick shut eye. Hello, uh, welcome, and thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Joshua Dyer. I am the Director of Marketing here at Myzeme of Toronto. Uh, I am a black man with a shaved head, an unshaven face. I'm wearing an off-white shirt over top of a white turtleneck. Uh, I'm in my home office and behind me is a poster from the 1976 Montreal Olympics. Um, for those of you that are new to Myzeum, uh, we are a museum that shares the diverse stories of Toronto, connecting the city's history to current issues and ideas. And because all of our stories are in some way rooted in our relationship to this land we call Toronto or Tukoronto, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the history of this land, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I'm personally grateful for the generations of Indigenous caretakers of these lands, lands that I've had the privilege and the pleasure of calling home. Tonight, my Zeum has the pleasure of hosting this conversation between author and transnational scholar Cecil Foster, as well as John Cartwright and Andrea Babington of the Toronto and York Region uh, Labour Council. This program was developed in partnership with the Toronto and York Region Labour Council as they celebrate their 150th anniversary, marking a century and a half of labour, of organized labour movements for a fair and just society. The conversation will highlight the railway porters fight for equality, both on and off the tracks, uh, how their enduring legacy has informed contemporary conversations about labor and race and has shaped the Canada we know today. Alongside tonight's discussion, Myzeum is launching a digital exhibit called Derail, the History of Black Rail Railway Porters in Canada, that has been developed in collaboration between Cecil Foster and Myzeum. This digital exhibit invites you to learn about the lived experiences of Black Railway porters and delve into uh, this lesser known chapter in Canada's history. Discover the community leaders who galvanized a moment, uh, historical moments in their struggle for equality and a legacy of nationwide social change through dramatic monologues, articles, archival photographs, artifacts, talks, and more. Uh, this program and the exhibit were originally created as part of Myzeum's annual festival, Myzeum Intersections, which explores, uh, it's a festival which explores Toronto through intersectional perspectives. Uh, I'd like to thank our festival and program funders, the Government of Ontario, uh, Canadian Heritage, uh, Ontario, Cultural, the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, as well as our community donors, Quadrille Property Group, uh, the McLean Foundation, and the Downtown Young BIA here in Toronto. A few reminders before we start the program. Uh, this program is an hour and a half long. A full recording of the event will be available a few weeks following the program, so please feel free to take breaks as you need them. Uh, we'll be sharing additional resources in the chat, and we welcome your comments and respectful discussion. We will finish 15 minutes. We will finish with a 15 minute question and answer period at the end of tonight's discussion. Uh, throughout the evening, you can submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, please note that live captions uh, for this event are available. Instructions on how to activate live captions will be in the Zoom chat. Uh, and now, to the main event of the evening. Uh, I'd like to invite Cecil Foster, transnational scholar 
and public intellectual, uh, also the author of They Call Me George, The Untold Story of Black Railway Porters and the Birth of Modern Canada, to open tonight's discussion. His work reveals chapters of Canadian history that ought to be fully told, uh, making evident how Black porters and the pursuit of justice in areas of employment, labor, citizenship, uh, have, set, uh, have set Canada on a course towards genuine multiculturalism and human dignity for all. Uh, and with that said, I'd like to hand it over to our esteemed guest, Cecil Foster. Thank you, Josh. And hello and uh, welcome to everyone. My name is Cecil Foster and I am an author, public intellectual and professor at the University at Buffalo State University of New York in Buffalo. I am honored to be the creator for this exciting and imaginative digital exhibition on the sleeping car porters. For those of you who can only hear me, I would describe myself as an old man, six foot two and medium to larger built. And if you hear an accent in my voice, that is the seasoning that I receive from my native Barbados, something that I cannot help but to carry around with me. I am particularly proud that we are continuing a very important conversation about the great legacy that primarily black men and women working as sleeping car porters and allies have given us. You would know that I first nudged conversations in this direction with the publication of my book, They Call Me George, The Untold Story of Black Train Porters and the Birth of Modern Canada, published by Bibliosis. There were other stories about the porters, but what was untold was how they helped to create the, in, in the entire Americas an official multicultural country, the modern Canada, as I call it. They led the struggle to change Canada from the old and traditional white man's country, common to all North America, into the demographically and culturally diverse country Canada is today. They set us on the track to dream of achieving social justice and reconciliation in a place that historically runaway slaves call heaven into a place where someday race does not matter. This year, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the official multiculturalism in Canada, indeed the world. And I cannot think of a better way to mark this occasion than by honoring these visionaries. In this regard, I want to thank many people for making this exhibition and this conversation happen. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Sharon Beckford Foster, my wife, for always helping me to think through these matters. I offer profound thanks to our host, Museum of Toronto, and the wonderfully imaginative team that decided to add this exhibition to their growing repertoire of good and engaging educational works. In particular, I want to thank those working closest to this exhibition, Nadine, Sarah, Josh, Nathan, Zambin, and Kathleen. They assembled a wonderful team, tracked down exhibits, and did all the hard lifting to make this happen. And in this vein, they commissioned a brilliant playwright Megan Swaby, who in turn assemble very talented actors to depict much in the lives and living conditions of porters. I thank director Byron Wong for his excellent film production. The results are gems that truly enhance the narrative of this exhibition. And talking about gems, porters on the railways were trained to be good housekeepers to be domestics. They swept, mopped, dusted, changed linen, made up beds, polished shoes, and kept washrooms spotlessly clean. Indeed, they hardly ever slept days on end when working. And while doing these domestic chores, they always had to keep an eye out for any stray jewelry, whether they be gems left behind by a forgetful passenger and had to be returned promptly, or those special jewels 
that in the railway accord were of the more creaturely kind. So that from day one, from orientation, new porters had to be schooled to be on the lookout for these gems and to report them immediately. Indeed, take a look at what playwright Megan and her team of actors depict as a typical orientation day for a porter, or they will do a better job than me trying to explain about these gems and jewelry. And afterwards, stay with us in conversation with the Toronto and York Region Labour Council on the sleeping car porters and modern Canada. Welcome. We're happy to have you as a valuable member of the team here at the Canadian Pacific Railway. All from the luxury of a sleeping car, which you will serve some of the most prominent citizens of this country. Be mindful of the comfort of those about you. Your behavior is always being observed. You must address passengers with a smile. Call them sir and madam. There's a delicate balance between being polite and accommodating and becoming too familiar with your passengers. Now, these cars are old and it's not uncommon to have to deal with some critters every now and then. It's not a regular occurrence, I can assure you, but if this happens, you must use the following words to communicate to your supervisor through a telegraph. If you spot a mouse, you say, I've come across some diamonds. Rats are sapphires. Rubies are roaches. Lice are opals. And the most serious of them all, pearls, which are bedbugs. It is vital that you do not give passengers any reason to be concerned. Most, if not all, of these can be dealt with right away. Again, I cannot stress enough you must not bring any attention if you discover any of these unpleasant critters. Keep to yourself. Do your job, do it well, don't complain. Stay out of trouble so you can collect your coin. Take pride in your work, it's an important part of the game. There's no better tonic for self-esteem than knowing your job thoroughly and putting up an outstanding performance. Hashtag black excellence. Hi, my name is uh, John Cartwright. I'm a carpenter by trade, grew up in Scarborough, live in the East End of Toronto and past president of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council. I'll never think of jewelry in quite the same way after watching that video. With me uh, tonight is Andrea Babington. Andrea. Hi, good night. My name is Andrea Babington. I'm the president of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council. I should say I am also a, a Jamaican. I, my, I, I work in the hospitality sector um, and also a member of United Year 75. You know, uh, Margaret Mead has a very famous saying, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, that's the only way it's happened. And tonight we're here to talk about a small group of thoughtful and committed individuals. But not that many Canadians know the story of the Black Railway Porters. Uh, their story is not taught in school. It, uh, it's not in most history books, but it is in a park in East York, honoring Stanley Grizel. And hopefully you're seeing a picture right now of Stanley. Uh, his father came to this country from the United States uh, building the railways on construction crews. Stanley was a porter and a leader, which we'll hear a lot about in a few minutes, uh, of the Brotherhood of Railway Porters and the Toronto Joint Labor Committee on Human Rights. And his son is actually with us tonight as well, because he's been very much part of continuing that legacy. Uh, and I'm gonna ask uh, Cecil to tell us a little bit about this amazing group of individuals, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Cecil. Thank you, John. And uh, it's a fascinating story that is that of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. 
until about the 1930s, almost into the 1940s, most porters working in Canada were unrepresented. They had to fend for themselves, whether they were on the, the Canadian National Railroad or the Canadian Pacific Railroad. And in 1939, one of the leaders um, wrote to the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was a fledgling trade union in the United States. And they said, look, um, what we are experiencing in Canada is as bad or if not worse than what is happening on the railroads in the United States. Can you come to Canada and help organize this? And that brought about a sea change in the, what was happening. Suddenly we had an organized group of porters who were concerned not only with the working conditions for themselves and their family, but they were concerned about social uplift. They were concerned about what would happen to the country. They were talking about labor rights. They were talking about women's rights. They were talking about youth employment and uh, the fact that young people were often going to work too early and were seldom paid well enough. And there were some of the best educated black men in the Western hemisphere because many of them came from all points. Several of them came from Jamaica, that's why Andrea just uh, referred. Many of them came from Barbados, and many of them came from many of the other British West Indian islands. And uh, they came and they worked with the porters who were already working out of Nova Scotia, Toronto, Winnipeg, and uh, Vancouver and areas like that. And they became a social force. And I argue that because of their social activism, they imagined Canada as a brotherhood, a fraternity, where all the peoples of the world can live peacefully and where they can thrive and Canada can become a great country noted for allowing people out of their human dignity to achieve whatever they aspire to be. And I think that's the goal of multiculturalism. And that is what I think that they gave us when in 1971, then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau announced that Canada would become officially the first multicultural country in the world. He was adopting many of the policies that the porters and their allies in the trade union movement had advocated. Thanks, Cecil. So that journey, that uh, that small group of, of, of individuals undertook is part of a bigger story. The labor movement in this city is celebrating 150 years of uh, since its inception in 1871. And Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about the Labor Council? You have to unmute. Yeah, as John mentioned, the, the Labor Council is celebrating its 150th year anniversary. And um, uh, it's definitely a year, uh, uh, unfortunately, the year where it's hard to celebrate in, in the midst of a pandemic, but it, it's an opportunity for us to really reflect and look back as uh, to how far that the Labor Council is coming from in, in, in fighting, uh, standing up for for working people and um, it, it linked all the way into our community where the fight continue. Um, uh, many years before that 1947, I believe the Labor Council started off the role of um, standing up uh, to fight against racism uh, within the labor movement. Uh, we represent uh, over 220,000 um, members. Um, and, and 150 uh, affiliates that uh, are spread out across the region and in all sectors. Uh, over the years, as the fight continue, uh, whether it's around, um, at, whether it's at the bargaining table or in our community fighting for, for decent wages, the Labor Council has always been at the forefront. Uh, in that uh, we do stand up for uh, uh, to support and, and our four pillars around economic, uh, social, um, uh, racial, and also um, social justice. 
where we feel uh, around these four pillars are where the issues that lie for, for working class people in this country. Hmm. Thanks. And so, uh, you know, back in the 1800s, as people were struggling for uh, economic justice, there weren't that many folks taking on the issues of racial justice, but there was uh, somebody called Albert Jackson who became the first black postman in 1882. And sadly, when he was hired on in Toronto, there was a terrible racist backlash from his fellow employees. And the black community had to rise up and reach out to the prime minister of the day, Johnny MacDonald, to get him uh, reinstated. And he was a letter carrier. So there's a, the, uh, there's a, a postage stamp with Albert Jackson's uh, face on it that came out just a couple of years ago. His union, the Postal Workers Union, has fought to try and honor that legacy of breaking down those obstacles and getting a job. Uh, and there's a, a song that's been written about him called Thank You, uh, Mr. Jackson. We can play that. Thank you, my friend, for all you've done. There will be now a street in your So that's one of the people whose legacy has been celebrated. And as we mentioned, Stanley Buzel, uh is has a park named after him. Cecil, uh, you've written an amazing book uh, called They Call Me George. And in that, you look at the Railway Porters Union as it developed here in Canada, long before it ever got chartered, but the struggles from before, and people like Stanley Grizel. Can you tell us a bit about that history? Thanks again, John. And uh, that history is a fascinating one in which it really showed how racialized people came together to fight to assert themselves. And, uh, and while I do acknowledge um, some of the good work that has been done by the labor movement of the day back into the 1880s and onwards, we also have to recognize that very often the fight by Stanley Gazelle and others were often with unions, in which unions at that time had clauses in their contracts, which indicated that black people could not be hired. Indeed, a sleeping car porter's job was one of those jobs, where from the turn of the century, certainly it was codified in the contract by CNR Rail that only black people could be sleeping car porters. And indeed, once you were hired as a sleeping car porter, you could not um, achieve any other position on the railroad than as a sleeping car porter. So you could begin working at the age of 16 and uh, retire at, nine, at the age of 65 or later, and uh, you would have no other opportunity than to be a sleeping car porter. And those were one of the things that the sleeping car porters and other Black allies fought against in the, certainly in the 1960s onwards under the Fair Practices Employment uh, Regulations that they also have imported from the United States to change that approach. And one of the significant things that the sleeping car porters and the, such people as Stan Gazelle did was had to fight to be part of the founding convention that met in Toronto to establish the Canadian Congress of Labor. 
many of the unions of that day did not want them to be involved. And indeed, um, Stanley Gazelle and Ian R. Blanchett and others had to run around the organizers to get even an invitation. And indeed, the story is there of when Blanchett was invited to attend a convention in the 1950s, he could not even get a, a hotel room at the Royal New York where all of the conventioners were, were, were staying. And he had to end up staying at the homes of um, fellow um, railroad porters in the city. And then ultimately, once Stanley and others broke down those barriers, they marched into the convention center at exhibition, what is now exhibition stadium, and uh, walked in with three very powerful resolutions in which they condemned the trade unions and they condemned the government of the day for racism and for anti-Black immigration policies. And that is the kind of image that I think helps to balance the, the, the two sides of the story of the sleeping car porters as a union in its own right, but one that also often had to fight even among its fellow unions. And we are going to uh, look at a clip of how Charles Ernest Russell uh, wrote to uh, A. Philip Randolph of the Porters. And guys in Winnipeg 15 years ago tried to start the Order of Sleeping Car Porters would have been the first black porter union. But that got shut down fast. Canadian National Railway stayed the same way. Don't want nothing to do with unionizing. I heard someone say, remove the plantation, replace it with a train car. I've been at Canadian Pacific Railway since 1918. I was fed up. We all were. So I did something about it. But I had to be smart. Dear sir, I am a porter of the Canadian Pacific Railway, domiciled in the city of Montreal, and I am general chairman of the Welfare Committee. I've been thinking for a long time to approach you as to whether you would consider our application to become members of the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, as there are a great many of us who feel that the present time is the most appropriate for us to become organized. To my surprise, I got a reply next week. <sighs> Dear Mr. Russell, may I say I think it's unquestionably sound, proper, and advisable that all the sleeping car porters should be in an organization, whether they work for railroads of the United States of America or in the Dominion of Canada. The carriers are bound to give you more consideration when they realize that you are members of an integral union. Therefore, may I assure you that the Brotherhood will be glad to accept the porters of Canadian Pacific Railway as membership. Sincerely, A. Phillips Randolph of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, Chicago, Illinois, USA. Tide is turning. The change is about to happen. Can you feel it? And as Cecil says, the, you know, the work of that union. Today, we use that phrase, dismantling systemic racism. Nobody used that phrase back in those days, but that's very much what they were doing. And that was about dismantling systemic racism in society, in the workplace, and yes, inside the labor movement, as well as in the communities. Uh, Cecil, tell us a bit about some of their key allies, people like Donald Moore. Yes, but, but let me say quickly about um, Charles Ernest Russell, um, who was born in Barbados. And, uh, and it's very interesting how he got to write that letter to Philip. And uh, he had been out traveling cross country and he had gone for about eight, nine days. And as was typical in that time, he was very sleepy because these guys were working sometimes 18 or 24 hours nonstop with no sleep. And when he got back into Montreal, um, he was called in and uh, reprimanded for supposedly sleeping on the, the train. And that's at the point when he had the last straw and he wrote to 
the Union south of the border and ask for help. Now also working at the same time were people like Donald Moore, who again was from Barbados and uh, came to live in Canada. And uh, when he arrived in Canada, the only job that he could find was as a sleeping car porter. He worked for a couple of years as a sleeping car porter and just couldn't take it. And then ultimately he left and set up his own business, became a, 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 a businessman in Toronto with a laundry. But he continued to be very active and to be a spokesman for the black community. And he specialized especially in immigration matters. Anyone who was black, who had an immigration matter came to him and he would intercede for them and uh, get the government to respond. And he working with people like Stanley Gazelle and Stanley's brother Norman and others, Bromley Armstrong and others, set up in 1951 what was called the Negro Citizenship Association. And their main task was to get Canada to open up its immigration policy, which since the first half of the, uh, the century, the last century, had effectively banned immigration from black countries. And they wanted a different type of citizenship, one where if you were indeed a British subject, whether you were a British subject born in Jamaica or Barbados or St. Vincent or St. Kitts or in London, it wouldn't matter whether you were white or black, you would be allowed to live in Canada. But at that time, if you were a, black, uh, a British subject and you were white, you automatically got into Canada. If you were a British subject and you were black, you could not enter the country. And working with allies, and then they went into politics, the, um, the cooperation of Commonwealth Federation, the C C P CCF, which ultimately became the New Democratic Party, and with trade union allies, many of them in Toronto, um, they set about lobbying the government to dismantle immigration policies and the fair housing and employment policies across Canada. Yeah, and when we go back and look at the story of others like, like Don Moore, uh, the, that uh, expectation that you could work in the railways but not do other things. Uh, there's a fellow called Rapid Ray Lewis who was the first black Canadian to win an Olympic medal. And he was a radio reporter starting in 1930. In 1932, he won an Olympic medal in the racing team for Canada. And when he came back and his home city of Hamilton was celebrating his amazing victory and his prowess, he asked some of the big shots work, uh, who ran Stelco and DeFasco, uh, I'd like to have a good job where I could stay here instead of traveling the country. Could you give me a job? And the answer was no, go and work as a porter. And that was the kind of uh, uh, reality. And Ray today, or sorry, has passed recently, but he then spent many years uh, involving uh, himself in educating young people. He was going to schools and telling people about that reality. He did become uh, somebody who was awarded the Order of Canada for his role. Uh, Andrea, there's many other folks that were working with their railway reporters. In 1947, the Toronto Joint Labour Committee on Human Rights was formed. Uh, tell us a little bit about that as an expression of, of the desire of the labour movement to actually challenge the racism uh, that was prevalent. So, if we look back at... Um, uh, the time of, uh, of, uh, of the or the ending of the the Second World War, um, everyone could imagine at that time um, at the ending of that, where this mass mobilization of workers um, just trying to secure um, decent wages, uh, labor right, and just dignity in their own workplace, and um, and, and and based on that. Uh, this uh, and also the fight against uh, fascism, fascism that, that was also deeply felt. The, um, the a group of, of um, black and Jewish trade union um, took on that fight. So by the by 1947, uh, the Toronto Joint Labour Community and 
human rights was formed to confront uh, uh, racist practice by employer and um, landlord and, uh, and also businesses. Uh, the Toronto Joint, um, uh, Joint Committee on Human Rights developed um, anti-racism presentation for union events. Um, this was also featured in, in, um, in, the, in our Labor Day parades and it was carried out, it carried out series of tests um, by visiting uh, hotels, um, restaurants, uh, clubs, and uh, to challenge um, discrimination. Because uh, I would say uh, during those time, there was, uh, there was uh, um, discrimination that was happening when, for Black not being able to get service, they were not able to enter into these venues. Uh, so this was uh, uh, just the uh, um, was was the right time to to have this. It also worked with the community activists to help to win the Ontario Fair Employment Practice Act um, in in 1951, and some of the earliest human rights legislation uh, um, across um, North America. This, uh, the Joint Committee worked closely with the Railroad Porter and also with Stanley Grazel and was, was in its leadership for many years. Donna Hill, mother of renowned author Lawrence Hill and singer Don Hill was the secretary um, treasurer um, for this committee. When this delegation of 35 um, Leaders from the Toronto Black community, including union leaders, uh, Bromley Armstrong and Stra Stanley Grizzle, uh, traveled to Ottawa to demand reform for Canada's racist immigration law. Um, the Joint Labor Community prepared a brief for the delegation. The Toronto Joint Labor, Labor Com Committee on Human Rights campaigned for many years and it work, its work was continued by the Labor Council in other forms fighting for human rights and employment equity, bargaining contract language for um, equality and farming human rights and, and equity committee and standing up to, to hate group has all been part of the labor um, essential work. Where the labor council um, just uh, recently as the rise of hate across our city uh, was able to to um, farm groups that that would be would show up at different location to push back uh, and and these racist group that was for rising up just recently. And Andrea, you mentioned uh, Bromley Armstrong. Just tell us a little bit about Bromley Armstrong. Sure. So Bromley, you know, I mentioned before about me coming from Jamaica, but also I would say someone who came in and uh, uh, into a place uh, thinking it's difficult and then realizing how, how different it, that could have been for me many years ago when someone like Bramley came here. And um, the, for Bramley who came in, uh, came from Jamaica, he, he was born in Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. And he's also, um, uh, the fourth child of, um, out of seven is the fourth child for his, his mom who was a nurse and his father who was also was a, a, a welder. Um, we were told that when he came to Canada, he already had two of his brother that was serving in the, the Canadian army um, during the second world war. Um, when Bramley came here, he was, uh, he came here and uh, 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 about a year later, he was only 19 years old. And um, he, he then went to work with the, as a laborer for Massey Harris. Um, and they are the maker of agricultural equipment. He wanted to be a, a welder just to follow into his father's um, uh, footstep. And with that, he went out and, and also, uh, sign up for welding classes and was told by the supervisor at that time that he should he's wasting his money because uh, he, that company um 
so far I did not hire any 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 person a black welder. So that was just merely a dream for for Bramley, and um, he then continue on, finish that uh, welding course, and then uh, about three times applied for this position that they continue to say that they, uh, they couldn't find his, uh, his application. Uh, but he, he, was, he wasn't giving up. Uh, Bramley then told us a, a bit about what, how he became active after this pushback where the, he wasn't getting this job uh, I think they were tasked in his, his um, application. He then seek the help of uh, the union rep um, where he was a, a union member in the CAW then, CAW local 439. And um, uh, again, with the help of this rep, um, promising to, to take on his work as, lo as long as he's active, Bramley then became active from that point on uh, um, and uh, uh, became a steward, uh, I would say, from description, a very fearful steward that took on the, the, the fight that they describe him as being shrewd labor activist. Um, uh, so I'm going to cut you off there, Andrea, because we, we uh, want to come back to the porters more, but I just, uh, yeah. Brownlee's a very important person and we... There's sure, a, a, sure. A yeah, so... Um, just just to wrap up that with the, with the work of the labor union um, that motivate him to take on more fight outside into the community as we heard around the joint um, uh, uh, labor committee where he continued to go out to see where there was discrimination and and and, and gather other force to to fight against these kind of discrimination. Thank you. Uh, but Bromley was uh, came in forty seven. I uh, only got in because his uh, brothers were in the armed forces. My parents came to this country in 1951 from the north of England. And because my father had been in the, in the army, uh, they were welcomed. But other black and uh, 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 Asian men who'd fought in the same war for the same army uh, were not welcomed. There was a bar here. But something was happening in Britain in the, in the, 19, in the late 1940s. And it's described now as the Windrush generation that actually that some doors opened in the UK that were still closed here. Cecil, can you tell us a tiny bit about the Windrush generation, that dynamic? It is difficult to talk about these issues in civil rights without seeing them all as part of a pattern. The civil rights uh, movement in the United States, the struggle for political independence in the British West Indies and elsewhere, and uh, what is happening in Canada as it developed and it becomes more of an affluent society. And there's a common narrative to them all. The Rinrush story is a story of how black men from the Caribbean had gone to war on behalf of Canada and the British Empire, and they had fought valiantly, and many of them should be considered to be war heroes. And at the end of the war, they were asked to return to their home countries, back to the islands. And many of them went back under great protests because their argument was why after they have fought for the empire, they could not go into places like Canada and they could not go and stay in the, the UK, when at the same time, the UK and Canada was allowing former enemy soldiers to come and settle in those countries. So these soldiers went back to the Caribbean and they were not happy with the conditions there and they wanted to go back to London and to Toronto and the places like that. Things were happening in the region where there was a new crop of politicians who in fact encouraged them and lobbied the Home Office in London, lobbied the Canadian government and said, why don't you take more black immigration? Do not kick them out because they are black. So the wind rush angle of it is that ultimately the British government sent a ship by the name of Empire Windrush to the Caribbean 
And it collected many of those West Indians and those former soldiers and airmen and others and took them back to um, the UK. And that was the beginning of what someone like Louis Bennett and others will call um, colonialization in reverse, where people from the colonies start going into these formerly white countries. And the Windrush generation are those who, like my brothers and sisters living in England, when, where my mother and father went when I was a little boy, and um, they're the ones who grew up and became British, and they are the descendants of many of those early immigrants that started with the Windrush ship. And that contrast of, of the exclusion still in Canada as compared to what was happening in the UK uh, helped spark, as Cecil had said at the start of this, a drive by the railway porters in particular to want to change the immigration laws of this country, the racist immigration laws of this country. And in 1954, there was a historic train trip with 35 delegates uh, to Ottawa. And we're gonna show you a quick clip of Bromley Armstrong's uh, memories of that particular trip. In 1952, the organization decided that they were going to try and arrange for a trip to Ottawa to speak to the prime minister of the country, who was uh, Louis Saint-Laurent at that time. Donald MacDonald, Secretary Treasurer of the Canadian Congress of Labour, was the person who arranged the, the meeting with the prime minister to start with. But when we arrived, we were told that the prime minister was not in the city. And we met with the minister, minister of immigration, Walter Harris. This started off in 1952, and the best date he could get was in 1954. We left April 26 from Union Station. 35 members of the delegation now went to Ottawa to speak with the Minister of Immigration, Walter Harris. When we got there, he was surprised that there were so many people. There were not enough chairs, so he had to go and scurry around to get chairs to be able to seat us. Donald Moore opened, uh, after he was introduced by Donald MacDonald, opened with his remarks saying, we were here as law-abiding citizens. We bring no sword, no gun, no explosive. Our only weapon is that of reason, justice, and love. And Cecil, what were the demands that that group was bringing to the government of Canada, to uh, the minister at that point in time? Well, the primary demand was for recognition of black citizenship, that black people were indeed British subjects and should have equality of citizenship in Canada. And one of the main things that they wanted was that citizenship would translate into allowing relatives living elsewhere in the empire to join them in Canada. So they demanded for a better form of immigration in fact, a non-discriminatory form of immigration. They also wanted Canada to be a place that would allow people to use their skills and their God-given skills. So for example, they advocated for the bringing in of domestic workers, young women from the Caribbean who were properly trained in home economics and things like that, so that they could come into Canada and just like the porters worked on trains, they would work in the homes of, um, of, of Canadians. And that was the beginning of the domestic workers program, which people like Donald Moore had fought for, which Bromley Armstrong fought for because he could not get his mother to come into Canada because of the restrictions. So they fought to have these issues aired with the government and they said, not only are we talking about black immigration, we are talking about why is it that people from the subcontinent, the south of Asia, Indians, Pakistanis, uh, people from Ceylon or Chinese, why are people who are non-white not allowed into the country? And in a special part where Stan Gazelle gave his speech, and I don't think anyone would dare write a speech for Stanley Gazelle, he always speak for himself. 
And he said, look, I think the only reason that this is happening is that because 80% of these people are non-white. And uh, I think he was very true. So one of the first things that they had got was the undertaking to allow in the domestic workers. And that was the opening of the door. And out of that program would then come the change in Canada's demography where the domestic workers program would translate into other programs to bring in domestic workers from the Philippines, from Eastern Europe, from Mexico, from elsewhere in Latin America. And uh, you know, what is significant about those things is that many of those domestic workers were very highly trained women. And when they came into the country, many of them quickly left domestic workers, and some of them even rose to some of the highest offices in Canada. And uh, our good friend Jean Augustine is somebody who talks about uh, you know, that journey that, that, that she took and many others. But Andrea, it's interesting that when the, the laws were changed, at first it was only to allow people to work specifically in the service sector in that kind of domestic service. Um, you, you came after that as, as immigration opened up, but your own journey coming and working in the hospitality sector, there's a lot of uh, a similarity to the kinds of things the porters were finding in the service they were providing on the trains. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I can, I can remember myself, uh, first day of work, uh, I would say as they tore me through the front of, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a hospitality sector. So walking through the lobby and seeing that luxury and was told by management that you will be treated like the guests. But then my the end of my tour, I, I was at the back in the basement that they call the, the back of the house. And that's where I find um, mostly people of color, hardly any white person work at the back of the house. Uh, for uh, a, a black woman who would go off to train for other um, skill, for example, wanting to be an engineer, she would, uh, I, and I remember one case like that, over and over apply for that job and wouldn't get it. Uh, another black person who would apply for a front desk agent, never. And as uh, if that worker or any one of us complain about it, the, that person would just be hired temporarily to go to the front where it's all white and suddenly they get transferred to Florida or, or somewhere they're not, they're not suitable for the front. Um, I, I, what was also startling to me when I started working um, in the hotel in housekeeping and quickly realized that it wasn't by accident. The, what the manager kept calling me by a different name. And I, I was annoyed and I went to her once and I said, this was my, my last name. I said, I think you are the only one who knows who's my father. And she said, why? I said, since the day I came here, you, it's not pronunciation, you call me a different last name. But then later learn that most of the worker was there, they were given a different name, Chinese worker, their name was changed completely. They, they actually named them differently to the point where their family recognized that name. Their paycheck is also the same name. And I, you know, we laughed for a long time and then realized this is not funny. Like they, they didn't see us as the person we, we came in. Uh, we learned quickly that a lot of the room attendants came with high skill but nobody wanted to know what that was. Um, the disrespect that came with that and uh, most people stayed because uh, they were, they were say, saying, and, and I think just encouraging each other that they were doing this for better life for their children. A lot of the women that was there left their children behind and was hoping that they would be able to do well for them with education. And, and then there was a, a, a large group that came long before me that came without their children and wasn't able to even sponsor them. They were not allowed to sponsor their children after coming into the country. So um, I don't see much, the, the, the difference with it, I think just grateful that as the union um, came in, 
and a lot of us recognize the use of the union that that changes a lot of uh, things for us. For a long time, a five cents was our pension. I did not know any different uh, to the, until the day when we organize with community and other unions to fight for, for that changes. And many of those women um, also had so many jobs that you couldn't believe where they find schedule to put it. And the children was just raising themselves. Uh, and and um, the, that kind of disrespect, the guests that come in and just see us as someone that they hand over their used clothes on their way out. Uh, 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 of the, the hotel and the guest was always right. That was the matter. So doesn't matter if you experience sexual abuse, um, it didn't go nowhere. It was our secret as the hotel would say it. Mm -hmm. uh, people was afraid to fight because they need that job. And, and so a lot of things was just swept under the rug. That sounds so much like the training session that the people are told to take whatever comes your way uh, Sasa, we've got a couple of questions on the, in the chat. Were there any women who were railway porters? Uh, and tell us about the Women's Auxiliary of the Railway Porters uh, Union. In short, there were no women, not because there weren't women who wanted to do the job, but because that was the way the system had it. Um, when the Pullman system was set up, what the sleeping car Porter's system was called the George Pullman system. He deliberately chose former slave men, enslaved men, to work as what would be called butlers and houseboys. So he didn't want women on the train. So he deliberately chose men. And often the joke would be made that what he did was that he feminized the men. And uh, sometimes the porters would be derogatively called chamber maids and said, well, all you do is carry out the chamber pots on the trains and that is, that is the job that should be done for females. So there were no females, but females were an, a very important aspect of the struggle. Indeed, when Asa Philip Randolph and those who founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters started, they in fact called their union the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids. They wanted women to be part of that organization, but it became very difficult to organize women who were working as domestics, not even in the hotels at that time, as Andre is talking about, but they were working in homes. So it was very hard to organize them on a house by house basis. And eventually they slid off the scene, but they remain very active as the women auxiliary. And they were the ones that kept the home front going. They were the ones that organized the conventions. They spoke at the conventions. Some of them were part of that delegation of 35 that went to Ottawa. They lobbied and they, um, kept the families and the communities going often when the porters were gone for long periods. So this success would not have been possible without the invaluable work of the women auxiliary uh, for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Care Porters. Thank you. And we're getting those. We'd ask you to actually put questions in the Q&A if you're all right, uh, rather than the chat. That's way, that way we can keep track of them. One of the other questions, uh, we're going to wrap up the formal part in a moment or two, but there's just one. And then we'll go to, to uh, uh, an open Q&A. Uh, but one of the other questions is, what was the relationship between and the links between the American and the Canadian porters through the Brotherhood or elsewhere? The truth is that there was very little difference and, uh, and, and very Often, people like Stan Gazelle and uh, Asa Philip Randolph would disagree on strategy because Asa and all of them saw the sleeping car porter system as simply one system. And Gazelle and Blanchett and others would sometimes say there are some nuances, some differences, because Canada is still a British Commonwealth country. But by and large, the conditions of labor, the conditions of working 400, 500 hours a week, 
existing primarily on tips of having no room while traveling to sleep, of not being able to sleep in hotels or to stay in hotels, but having to stay at homes in black communities. The conditions were very much the same. So it wasn't really different because the model of what constituted the sleeping car porter was simply a, a business model that looked to provide an elite service by people who were domestic workers. And it didn't matter whether it was in Canada uh, or in the United States, or indeed, as it will later turn out, in parts of the Caribbean, Latin America, and even in the Western and Southern Africa. And another question is, how were porters penalized if they stepped out of line? Was it automatic termination or were there you know, warnings? What, what was that penalty system like that was hanging over their head uh, that was mentioned in the video? Wonderful story um, about that. The, you are talking about what was called the demerit system whereby there was a list of points that would be accumulated not for value of service, but for demerits. And if you did a number of sequential things and uh, the number added up and it met a magic number, you might be terminated. Now, there were some offenses that you were terminated on the spot, such as if you were caught drinking or if you, were, in fact, were to touch a female, especially a white female, or uh, if you were to um, be caught with a firearm, or if you were to be caught in a fight. And then there were lesser uh, penalties for if you didn't show up with the polish for your shoe box and you couldn't polish the shoes. And of course, a big fine if you were caught sleeping. Now, what I want to do is to show the ingenuity of the um, sleeping characters. When they went to Ottawa, and the Canadian government engaged them about what then should we have as a way of choosing people freely from around the world um, to come into Canada, they suggested a point system. And that was nothing more than using the demerit system. And instead of having numbers that led to your dismissal, it was positively accumulating points when you apply to come into Canada that ultimately would allow you to cross the threshold that you got into Canada. And that point system is still very much in place today. And indeed is often referred to as an, a better system than that that is used in the United States and, and elsewhere. So it is a story with a wonderful ending of how what started as something to punish porters, they were able to turn it around and to use it as a reward system. And another question, uh, where did most of the porters come from? What part of the country, what part of the North America, what part of the Caribbean? Where's the, no, you're the talking about, you're talking about from the 19, the turn of the last century to the 1960s of where the population, the black population in Canada was no more than 20,000 people. And this was at a time when the Canadian population was really ballooning. But Canada had, in fact, kept Black people out of the country. And very often when they wanted porters, they would go down to the British West Indies and they would look for some of the brightest and smartest schoolboys and bring them up and uh, offer them work as uh, sleeping car porters while they worked their way through university. So many of the prominent leaders in the Caribbean came up and worked as sleeping car porters. In addition, there were black communities in Windsor, in the Annapolis Valley and areas of um, Nova Scotia that they turned to regularly for porters. And then they would go into those communities and again, pick out the elites from among them and dress them up in their uniforms and make them stand out and that is where they got the bulk of the porters from. And of course, they also allow some of them in from the United States. And we, uh, because they were uh, often 
rubbing shoulders with some of the elites in Canada, survey elites, you had mentioned in an earlier discussion that they, they sometimes were actually able to talk to directly top executives, leading politicians with either a personal question or suggesting that they should be doing something to make changes. Just give us a little bit about that flavor uh, of some of those interactions. That's very true. And because many of the politicians and business people of the days travel on the same train, the same route um, regularly, and they got to know intimately the porters that work with them. And uh, to some extent, within reason, they became friends. One of the notable examples for that is the man who would become prime minister, John Diefenbaker, who in his traveling from Ottawa down through Toronto and elsewhere and on to Prince Albert in Sask uh, Saskatchewan, got to know the porters very well. And he came to be known as the friend of the porters. And through the porters and their relationship with him, John Diefenbaker got to fall in love with the British West Indies. And he developed relationships with politicians in the, the Caribbean. And indeed, um, he was begin to spend his winter vacations in Barbados. And it is interesting that um, when John Diefenbaker died, that on the front page of the Star newspaper of that day is a wonderful picture of the sunset on the west coast of Barbados and of John Diefenbaker lying on the, uh, a beach chair. And that was the sunset of his life. And indeed, it is, the story is told that it was while John Diefenbaker was in Barbados that many of the women who would become domestic workers actually protested outside of his guest house. And he came and he interacted with them. And that made it a lot easier for the Barbados government and others to step in and work with the porters on the domestic workers program. Now you can read about these kinds of fascinating histories if you get uh, Cecil's book, They Call Me George. You can get it online. I think we've got a connection there. You can also go down to one of our favorite bookstores, a different book list, on Bathurst and Bloor and, and pick up copies. It would be a great gift for you to give uh, to anybody in the holiday season. Uh, the, we're going to uh, wind down this part and then uh, do a little bit of a film clip and come back to some more Q&A because actually there's a lot more questions and most of them are for Cecil. Uh, but Andrea, I want to maybe end uh, this formal part with your observations about the legacy of the railway porters. They picked up a torch and said, we've got to struggle against injustice. We've got to struggle for a different kind of Canada. How do you see the labor movement today connecting with that legacy and honoring you know, the challenge they brought to all of us to make this a better, uh, a better place? Uh, I would say the, 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 the terms, it's a hard road to travel. Um, I've, uh, the work that's done and what um, Cecil um, uh, uh, Stanley, Stanley also did, opening up that door for us. I, I, at this phase, I think we go one step forward, two step backward. And with that saying, the, uh, the, labor, the labor movement have a lot of work to do um, to continue this, uh, this fight. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy. Um, when we're coming from our community already angry uh, about the way that it, it's structure, um, we're living differently from our neighbor down the street, um, getting into workplace where through greed, it's not uh, a mama and papa shop. It's really about uh, um, corporation that, that build their empire off the back of, of um, uh, of discrimination and racism, then, it, it, then on our children that goes into the the, the education system and, and still have to go through all of that. It's a lot of work, and and that's why uh, as we continue to tackle racism for the labor movement, the work is there. Where if, uh, even the labor council, we have to take it a little bit at a time. It's an urgent situation, but a little bit at a time to make sure that um, labor is continuing the education around hate, 
and recognizing it and also at the time where we are now making space at these tables for people of color, recognizing the skill that they bring, um, making it noted about the importance of, of people of color, um, what they carry, because a lot of what we are enjoying right now is built on the back of uh, people of color. And those stories are not told. Um, our children are these these information are hidden from our children. So definitely we gotta make sure that um, when it comes to education and mobilizing within our workplace, um, we're making sure that we are mobilizing in, in our in, in uh, politically having government on our side and pushing to strengthen some of these policy and taking a lot of these um, languages to our bargaining tables to to make changes. For, for our people of color. And that is expressed, that sense of hope and, 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 and passing the work on is expressed in this clip that we're gonna show of, uh, of the actor uh, reflecting on Grant Stanley Grizel's uh, words. Can we show that now? I never throw anything out. <laughs> I still have my name tag too. I have piles of papers and photos going all the way back. I was smart enough to keep everything. Knew that I needed to keep everything to make my own history book. Every letter I drafted and received, kept it. Receipts, as the youth say. That day in Ottawa in 1954 was a collective effort towards the long and hard turn Canada needed to make. It's all good and fine to be the first. I was the first black man to run for a seat in the Ontario Legislature for the NDP. I was the first black Canadian to work for the Ontario Ministry of Labour. I was appointed by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau as a citizenship court judge, which makes that the first time that a black person has held that title. All these firsts can distract from the collective effort. We don't want just one to rise to the top, to be the exception. That's what some of these young people are showing us. I'm watching it all, watching and smiling. Young people, boy. Believe it or not, I like to take the bus to get around. Sit back and have someone take me somewhere. And all those faces I see shows me the change we are fighting for. Doesn't mean the work stops, it never stops. Brings to mind Minister Kafik. He was a good guy. He used his voice to remind those in the federal government that multiculturalism didn't begin in 1971. Its roots go deeper. I saw this city transform in a way I could never imagine. Born right here in Toronto, November 18, 1918, and died November 12, 2016. Look at that. I stepped into life in the month of November and left 98 years later. Not sure what that means, but I know God put me here for a purpose, and I did my best. I think I did all right. And that's, you know, use of culture and arts is so important to be able to live these history again. Uh, Cecil, there's a bunch more questions. We're going we're gonna to go right to the late 30 or maybe a couple minutes after that. Did the Sleeping Car Porters Union organize cultural and recreational activities for its members and their families? Oh, for sure. And, and let me say that Stanley Gazelle did more than just all right. Stanley Gazelle and others changed a country. And they change a country in a way that it stands as a prototype of what others can become, including the United States of Canada, uh, the United States of America. And yes, um, Stan and others were deeply involved in cultural events. And the roots, in fact, do run deeper because um, even when we think of things like Juneteenth, um, the event was often celebrated on both sides of the border. Um, 
people from the United States coming across to Canada, Canadians and Windsor and Toronto and Buffalo and, 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 and Detroit and areas like that going across and sharing. So there were always those events that were happening. Jazz often drew them together and literature. Indeed, I remember when I started out as an author in, the, in, in Toronto, that Stan would be at just about all of my book launches and uh, very encouraging. And uh, going through his funds in, uh, in Ottawa, I was pleasantly surprised to see that he actually had some material in there on me. <laughs> yes, so in fact, he in fact kept just about everything that his hands seemed to have touched. So the Sleeping Gap quarters touched just about every aspect of Black life. It had to, because the truth is that a generation or so ago, people like me would in some way be involved in quartering, whether it be as messengers or carrying of parcels or taking luggage up to rooms or elevator workers or um, red caps and things like that. That was what we would have been. And it took the imagination of people like Stan and Blanchett and uh, Philip in the, the US and elsewhere to change all of that. And I like to tell my students at UB and those, especially in my grad class is that um, it is all one experience. It is one transnational experience that we are talking about. It is just that it is manifested differently in different settings. Mm -hmm. You've got a whole lot of people uh, in chats also saying that they think your book should be compulsory at reading in schools so that all Canadians can learn about this. In fact, we have people from not just across Canada, but from the US and the Caribbean on tonight's call. I wanna thank them. Many of them have families who were porters uh, within their extended family and some who actually served as porters uh, the way through. A couple of questions came from them. Uh, there was locations where uh, it seemed the porters were sleeping and it wasn't in railway hotels. Uh, was there segregation and where they got to stay or had to stay uh, during trips and between trips? Uh, and then another question is about how many years did it take for Black porters to be promoted to conductors? And I know that's a whole story, but maybe you could ask those to answer those two, uh, those two questions. Well, when um, porters were traveling, um, the railroads would make arrangements for large houses. Maybe someone in the community would have a house and they would let certain rooms to the railway. And, uh, and it was just a regular turnover. Sometimes people would just be sharing the same bed. They might be um, from different trips and uh, it would become a place where they slept, um, maybe took a shower, took um, some food, and then jump back on to the train and continue um, back home or wherever. It wasn't that they indeed got to go to a hotel or even a motel or a room in the house. And they were often billeted at people in the community. And in terms of um, people getting um, promoted, this was one of the wonderful achievements of people like Stan Gazelle working with his allies in the, the Canadian um, Jewish community and the, the Canadian Human Rights um, task force in Toronto, where they pushed to get the government to allow sleeping car porters to act on probation for a while as um, conductors. And this was a big struggle, and it did not happen until the 1950s. And this was an achievement that was celebrated right across the United States and Canada right across North America. And then ultimately, when it all really came together was in the 1960s, when the government took over both CPR and CN Rail and created what is now Via Rail. And at that time, much of the struggle had shifted to the Canadian Brotherhood of Railway employees and people like Lee Williams in the, uh, Winnipeg, who also came through Toronto and elsewhere, and they fought for the integration of one union for Via Rail, where you would not have 
a union with a division and a list of employees that were black and a div uh, another division that were white. They are called for the merging of those lists and that did not happen until the 1960s. And uh, in fact, uh, we've got uh, uh, somebody on the line whose uncle was uh, Mr. Blanchett that you mentioned, the key organizer for the, the Brotherhood of Railway uh, Porters. And we've got many others, as I said, in the line who were, uh, who were who's got, who are families of either on, in the auxiliary or in railway porters themselves. The, uh, I think we're gonna ask one last question. Did they reach out to other black workers? to support this incredibly important effort? Oh yes, they, they did. And uh, when you look at the list of representatives that went to Ottawa in 1954, you'll see that it came from the unions representing the auto workers, and unions that represent all aspects where black people were beginning because of the fair employment uh, practices to start to gain entry so there was the very collective move on the part of the um, delegation. This was led by the porters to be as comprehensive and to involve representatives from Montreal and Winnipeg and elsewhere to go with them as well. So that it wasn't only just a Toronto focus, although Toronto was the, provided the, the, the bulk of the representation. But I want to sort of step on something that, um, or go back to something that Andrea said and uh, about the, where we are systemically and the, and, 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 and the future. And why Stan Gazelle would be proud to see someone like um, Andrea holding the position that she, she does. And, uh, and, and the hopefulness that was always there in Stan's um, messages. And I like to think that Stan would think that where we are now as a multicultural Canada is no different than if we were taking a cross country transcontinental train ride back in his day. And we either boarded in Vancouver and is um, hope to end up um, in Halifax, or maybe we started in Halifax and we plan to end up in Vancouver. Each destiny is social justice and racial um, equality and things like that. And, uh, and I think that Stan, if I may be so bold as to speak for him, might think that we have indeed made some progress since the 1950s. And that maybe whether we are coming from the East or from the West, we might be get as far as Toronto, but we are not yet there. We are not at the destination. We haven't reached reconciliation. We haven't yet reached that Canada that Stan and Blanchett and Chevalier and all of those others fought for, and that there's still a long way to go before the call that we heard at the start of this presentation by those wonderful actors telling us to get on board, get on board, would be the call that will say we have arrived. We have not yet arrived, and as Andrea suggested, we still have quite a ways to go on that journey. And I think that's a wonderful way to wrap up the evening with that message, Cecil. I want to thank Andrea Babington, President of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, for being with us tonight. You can find out more about the 150 years of uh, labour struggle at labour150.ca. Uh, the uh, want to recognize that on the uh, in the audience is also Rosemary Powell, who directs the Toronto Community Benefits Network that has helped to negotiate uh, career paths and openings for you know, black uh, uh, youth, indigenous, uh, other workers of color into skilled trades and that this journey absolutely continues. And most of all, I uh, wanna thank Cecil for the work that you've done bringing this story to light and certainly the appreciation from our audience tonight lets you know people appreciate that. Myzeum as our partner in presenting tonight and the work that they've got that you can go to uh, by visiting uh, Museum Toronto. And uh, please thank you uh, all for joining us tonight in this wonderful, wonderful conversation. It's part of our history that we have to reach back to understand, celebrate and use to guide our journey forward as Andrea and Cecil have said. Thank you all for joining us. Take care, good night. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I just want to end the evening. My name is Nadine Villasine Feldman. I'm the director of programming at Myzeum. And I'd just like to end the evening by thanking all of our speakers this evening for such a rich and informative conversation. Um, thank you, Cecil, Andrea, and John. Um, special thanks um, to the Toronto and York Region Labor Council, as John mentioned, the partners on this program. I'd like to thank you, uh, say thank you to all the individuals and institutions that gave permission to use the images, videos, and music featured in tonight's program and the Derail Digital Exhibit, um, Expo Rail, Canadian Railway Museum, Archives of Ontario, City of Toronto Archives, Multicultural History Society of Toronto, Library and Archives Canada, Latanya. Sonia and Stan Grizel Jr., Matt Dusenberry, and many more. Um, we're so grateful for the ongoing collaboration and cooperation we've received from people and organizations that have supported the many iterations of Derailed. Um, but we'd like to give special thanks to writer Megan Swaby and director Byron Wong for developing the dramatic interpretations you had a glimpse of tonight to 0110, um, Iron Bay Media and Union for partnering with us on the production. Also a shout out to Toronto Railway Museum, Ontario Black History Society, City of Toronto and Mayworks who have supported Derailed uh, at its inception. Finally, a huge thank you to our staff at Myzeum who have just worked so hard and tirelessly, tirelessly on this program and this digital exhibit. Um, please be sure to explore the Derail digital exhibit on our website where you can see more of the dramatic monologues that were featured in tonight's program, as well as photographs, artifacts, talks, and other resources. Um, and you can go to our website, myzeumoftoronto.com and sign up for our newsletter uh, to stay up to date on all our programming. Thank you so much for coming tonight.